Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I'm here today at HK's Grey Room in Ashburn, Virginia, taking a look at some cool aspects of HK's uh, firearms development history. And specifically today, we're taking a look at the G36. And this would really be a pretty revolutionary uh, departure for HK from its entire previous history of rifle-type products, because for once, this is not a roller-delayed action. Uh, the G36 originated basically in the flaming demise of the HK G11, uh, the caseless ammunition, multi-shot burst, very futuristic-looking rifle that was on the verge of adoption in, like, 1989, 1990, uh, when it, it, the whole project was then cancelled as a result of German reunification. And the costs that were associated with that uh, and the lack of maybe so much of a need for a, a really cutting-edge new military rifle. However, that left the German army, the Bundeswehr, still using the G3 rifle, which was at this point 40-plus years old. And they really did need to modernize it. Maybe not so much because they anticipated a large-scale major war coming, but because they really needed to have a little more ammunition compatibility with all the rest of their allies. By this point, by the 1990s, almost everyone has adopted 5.56, but the Germans hadn't. They still had those old 7.62mm G3s. So uh, at this point, by 1993, the German military put out a request for a new rifle. They didn't really have the money available for a whole new development program. Uh, that money had kind of gone into the G11, which went nowhere. Uh, they did also, interestingly at this time, they did have the option of adopting the AK-74, because when East and West Germany reunified, the, the new combined nation acquired East Germany's massive stockpiles of AK-74s. But adopting that rifle wasn't seen as being a, a politically realistic option. So they needed something new in 5.56. Now, uh, without the money for a development program, what they did instead was look at other rifle options that were currently available. Now, HK knew that something like this was coming. And even if it wasn't going to be with the German government, they wanted to have the opportunity to be selling a modern 5.56 rifle uh, to the world military market. They had tried with the, uh, the G41 uh, in the 70s and 80s, and that rifle hadn't really gone anywhere. It was more of an upgrade than a, a whole new system. So. Uh, HK had been running, had been developing what it called the HK-50, which was a project to develop a new short-stroke gas piston rotating bolt rifle, basically a technological derivative of the AR-18. Um, one of many technological derivatives of the AR-18 that we see in military service today. When the German army came around, came looking for uh, new potential rifles, the HK-50 was one of their prime contenders. Uh, another actually was the Steyr AUG. They tested these two rifles against each other, and in 1995 they formally chose the HK-50 to become adopted as the German Gewehr 36. And that is what we have here. So let's go ahead and take a look at how it works. Because, actually, to be technically specific, what we have here is a G36E, the export version with its optic, and we have a cutaway transparent receiver, uh, standard German Army G36, with its very much different optic. We're going to go ahead and start with this one, which is actually technically the export version. It's also technically the machine gun version. So you can see this is marked HK MG36E. The E is for export. And the MG36 was a version that was intended to be adopted by the Bundeswehr as a, um, a supplemental, you know, a, a squad support weapon using, instead of the standard 30-round box magazine, a, uh, a Beta C-Mag 100-round double drum, and a slightly heavier profile barrel. Now, the, the Bundeswehr in testing found that the, the additional weight to the barrel was so minor that it really didn't actually justify having a different pattern of rifle. And so they went ahead and just decided that the support weapon would be a standard rifle with a bipod uh, mounted to it and that drum magazine. So. Uh, the MG36 never got adopted in German service, um, never really sold very well, as far as I know. Um, so it's interesting that we actually have an export E pattern MG36 here. 
Now the German military pattern is a three position trigger, S, E and F, safe, single shot and uh, full auto. On the export versions you can get different, uh, different sorts of trigger options. This particular one also has a two round burst built into it. The controls on the G36 are completely ambidextrous, which is pretty cool. Uh, the charging handle is integral to the bolt carrier, we'll see this when we pull it out, and it just has a spring-loaded handle that you can pull to either side. The magazine release is a, an AK sort of type of paddle down here. Um, this uses its own proprietary 30 round translucent magazine, so you can see how much ammunition is left in it. Uh, typically these actually have lugs on them to allow multiple magazines to be uh, buckled together, clipped together. So mag release is also ambidextrous. The safety selector is ambidextrous. Um, you already saw it on the other side. The only thing that can't be changed is the ejection port, which is only on the right side, but has a case deflector there uh, to make sure that cases don't come straight back enough to hit the shooter. The standard buttstock for the G36 is a side folding type. Uh, push in the button and then that unlocks it. One neat feature here is that this little hook on top of the case deflector is the latch that locks the stock in place. So uh, one part there serving multiple functions. And to open it you just pop it off, uh, off that hook. There is a lot of, uh, of fiber reinforced polymer that went into the manufacture of these guns. In fact, the majority of the parts are polymer, with the exception of the barrel and the actual working bits. One other thing we should point out here before we move along to disassembly is the optics package. This is a removable rail that on the export version has a 1.5 power magnified optic, a pretty basic sort of thing. Uh, you can see from the screws here this can be removed, replaced with other types of optic. It does, interestingly, uh, also have a, a set of attachment points up on top for some other specialized uh, accessories. This is a, actually a Bundeswehr uh, night vision optic. And what's cool about this is you can see the it takes in light here and it actually kind of periscopes it down to right here. This mounts into the carry handle. Lock that in place. Get this all the way down. There we go. That goes up there. And that now acts as a night vision optic for, uh, or a night vision uh, image intensifier for your optic. While this may not be a standard HK roller delayed locking system, it does use the HK pattern or style of uh, a, a number of basic push pins to disassemble the gun. So there's one here which holds the back of the, pis the, the trigger assembly. There's one here that holds the front of the trigger assembly and the magazine well, which is a removable element. And there's one here that holds on uh, the front handguard. So we can pop those out. There are actually holes in the stock to retain them, so you don't lose the pins. One of the interesting elements here is, unlike the, uh, the earlier G3 and G33 series, uh, the stock does not come off. Uh, you instead fold the stock to the side and you can then pull out the internal parts. So we've got all three pins out now, which means I can go ahead and pull out the fire control group and the pistol grip. Uh, these are mostly polymer fire control parts. There's a little metal insert in the face of the hammer to give it some wear resistance. But other than that, like the Steyr AUG, uh, all plastic parts in there. We can slide off the magazine well. They do also, or later, made uh, M16 pattern magazine wells. So you can, you can use M16 magazines on an export gun if you want it configured that, that way. The handguard just slides off the front once we unpin it. I will point out the bipod here is attached to the handguard, and this is a free-floated handguard. So you're not going to uh, lose your, your, your zero by shooting the rifle off the bipod. Um, these bipod legs, uh, you just pull out to extend them. They do have a little bit of pivot, and then there's a locking catch on each leg that you have to depress in order to fold them. So this is the MG version, and you can see that the barrel gets a bit heavier 
behind the gas block. This is not all that much heavier of a barrel, so I can certainly understand why the Bundeswehr decided that this wasn't worth having a separate version of the gun for. The bipod can attach to any standard rifle handguard, so it, that, that's pretty interchangeable and universal. Now, to get the internal parts out, we just fold the stock. And then, right here, we can pull out what is basically a rear cap uh, for the, the stock uh, socket in there, and also the fixed recoil, fixed and captive recoil spring. Then, just push the bolt carrier out the back, and that's basically it. So the bolt carrier here, like I said earlier, has the charging handle built into it. We have a multi-lug rotating bolt. This is very much the AR-18 in concept. Um, a short stroke gas piston that's going to impact the bolt carrier right there. There is our gas piston. This is basically identical to the G-43 from World War II, which is basically identical to the Soviet Tokarev system. So when this goes back, it pushes right there which hits the bolt carrier and causes the rifle to cycle. Um, when you fire, this whole thing only reciprocates about six millimeters, so about a quarter of an inch. Um, and when that piston strikes the bolt carrier, it, uh, it forces it backward with enough velocity that even though it's only, uh, only a short little bit of acceleration, it's enough energy to get to cycle the whole rifle. I don't have a bayonet handy to show you, but one of the neat anecdotes here, uh, well, I mentioned that when Germany reunified, the new, you know, unified Germany had a massive supply of AK-74s of East German production. They also had AK-74 bayonets, and while it wasn't politically viable to adopt the 74 as a rifle, yeah, there was nothing really so bad about using the bayonets. So because they had so many, um, and A, it's just a knife, Rather than design any sort of new bayonet to fit the G36, they just designed the G36 to accept an AK-74 bayonet. So pretty much the whole body assembly of the rifle here is polymer. Um, the barrel comes back to a trunnion that is molded into this part of uh, the polymer body. That's, that is the, the focus of the current um, hullabaloo about whether or not this rifle is actually combat effective. Um, Without having gone through all of the details of that story, I'm going to hypothesize that I think the rifle is probably pretty darn good as is, uh, and the problems it has come from being pushed beyond its, uh, its legitimate expected uh, uh, performance envelope. So you can see the, the bolt right here, its cam pin, we've got our charging handle right here, and you can see when when the gas piston strikes the bolt carrier and pushes it back, what it is going to do, just like the AR-18, this is going to cycle backwards just slightly. It's going to start forcing this cam pin down, which forces the bolt to unlock. Note right back here we are recocking the hammer with the back end of the bolt carrier. Once the bolt head is fully rotated and unlocked, it's then going to travel backwards. Extract the empty case. We have recocked the hammer back here. It's going to come all the way back to this position. It's then going to start coming forward again, pick up a new cartridge, push it into the chamber, and once the bolt hits uh, the chamber there, it of course stops, but the bolt carrier keeps moving, which is going to rotate this cam pin back up, force the bolt to, uh, to rotate and lock into position, and uh, re-trip the auto sear right here and make this ready to fire again. You can see exactly how the gas piston system works here. So gas comes vented up from the barrel there. It's going to push on the front here, which is going to push this whole piston backwards. It's under enough spring pressure that I can't just poke it back with my thumb. Uh, and then as soon as it's traveled far enough, this pin is fully pulled out of this hole which allows the gas pressure to then vent out the front of the gun um, once it's moved enough to cycle the rifle. Where the export guns had a single 1.5 magnification optic, the, the Bundeswehr optic is this interesting multifunction device. 
Uh, it actually has a, a laser over on this side. It has a red dot optic on top, and it is a no battery power. It's uh, powered just by ambient light. And it has a three power magnified optic down here. If we look at the front of this, you can see this is the red dot, this is the magnified optic, and that is the laser. And then if we look at the back here, you've got your two viewing ports for magnified and non-magnified, uh, battery for the laser, an on-off switch for the laser, and then we have this hood on top for the red dot to allow you to adjust how much uh, light is getting in. So if, it's, if the dot's too bright or too dim, you can adjust it that way. This optic is kind of an interesting concept. Uh, it's definitely a compromise in a lot of ways, but it, it doesn't suffer, to me at least, uh, and granted this is of course someone with no combat experience with the rifle, and in fact basically no range time experience with this optic. Uh, it seems to be a better compromise than some of the other stacked optics out there because it was all built as one unit. So uh, you have to lift your head and your cheek weld a bit for the red dot, but it's a little bit more like, uh, well, like that kind of interesting uh, Leupold prismatic sight that was out uh, briefly, or, or uh, price still is available but never became very popular, where you, you pull your eye down a little bit and you've got a magnified view, you bring your eye up a little bit and you've got a faster red dot. Um, and it's an interesting concept. It's obviously worked out well enough for the Bundeswehr because this is still their standard optic on the rifles. So yeah, a, a neat and unusual, unorthodox solution there. Overall, what HK produced with the G36 is really a remarkably um, efficient, ergonomic, economical, it's a simple rifle, it handles nicely, it's really very, very nice. Um, which, to be honest, is kind of what you would expect for one of the last of the, the main military pattern 5.56 rifles. They had a lot of a lot of examples to look at in the design for this, and so uh, it shouldn't come as that much of a surprise, especially with a company like HK, uh, that the, the final design they came up with was quite good. Now there are a couple other versions. There is a short, there's a carbine version, uh, and also a, well, a K and a C. Um, two various shortened versions uh, with special forces use today. Some of the shortened versions have replaced these sorts of uh, standardized fixed optics with Picatinny rail, um, so that users have a choice for all manner of, um, of aftermarket optics, as well as uh, quad rails or undermounted rails on the front end. Um, a lot of that sort of modern tactical modularity has been built into the gun. But um, as, ha you know, as with many other militaries where the special forces sorts of operators get a lot of uh, added modularity and, and new stuff, while the standard army retains the basic pattern of rifle. That's, that's uh, still true with the Bundeswehr as well. So the rifle, uh, well, with the dual optic, but otherwise in this configuration, is the, has, has remained the standard, uh, standard equipment for the German army. Today the G36 has wound up being a pretty darn successful rifle. In addition to being adopted as the standard German military uh, rifle, and uh, selling something like 176,000 of them to the Bundeswehr. Uh, the rifle was also adopted fairly early on in 1998 by the Spanish military to replace all of their rather unsuccessful and unreliable Setme Ls, uh, Setme L rifles. Uh, so it got those two major contracts, and then it's also been adopted by a large number of smaller defense and security forces, everything from the London police to, I think there are some police departments in America that actually use these. Um, uh, the US Capitol Police actually use the G36. And then a whole slew of special forces and police and military organizations around the world. So um, it has been quite successful for HK. Now just fairly recently um, there has been some dispute, some scandal surrounding the G36 and its performance when, basically when subjected to extreme heat loads. Uh, we will leave a discussion of that for a future video where we can uh, properly dig into all those details. But um, hopefully you guys enjoy, appreciate getting this chance to take a look at the, the actual legitimate original G36. Not a, not a converted SL8 like we normally see in the US, but um, on the, in HK's own grey room here taking a look at their uh, standard examples. So a big thanks to HK for giving me this access, and thank you guys for watching.